uh, balls and chains and come alongs and we've got all kinds of weird stuff that we use. We even have a picture of the original jail, which interestingly enough, had no locked doors. The way they kept the prisoners in was they would break glass bottles around the outside and take their shoes away. And that was the first Broward County Jail. So um, just, just as an as a aside. Now, uh, does anybody want any particular lead off with any particular subject matter? Like for example, what's going on with Sheriff Tony right now? Or uh, should we just get into the PowerPoint? Hearing nothing, is anybody alive out there? No, hearing no response. All right, why don't you just go right to the PowerPoint? We'll start talking about what's there. Hannah, can you put up those slides? Okay, so that's the name of our nonprofit, Crime History Inc., which we operate. Uh, it's a 501c3, so if any of you have some extra change lying around from your gumball machine, you'd want to donate it to uh, a nonprofit, it's tax deductible. Go ahead, Hannah. Uh, you want me to talk about Sheriff Tony at the end? Happy to. He's one of my favorite subjects nowadays. Okay, so um, you can see the slide, it speaks for itself, but the three photos are of great interest in the history of the Sheriff's Department. Um, I don't know what happened to them, they were just on the screen, there you go. So the gentleman on the left, to my left, is Reuben Stacy, who was uh, lynched by the Sheriff of Broward County and his chief deputy, his brother. Now that was Robert C. Clark and his brother, Bob. And the two of them terrorized the black community for the entire 17 years that uh, Walter C. Clark was the sheriff of Broward County. He was and still is the long, longest serving sheriff in the history of Broward County. And he was a, an avowed racist, proud of it. Uh, he and Claude Pepper used to get together and talk about how the South will never accede to the voting, uh, the voting rights of the blacks. And this was, Claude Pepper, as you may recall, was had a transformation later on in his life, and he became a civil rights advocate. But for many, many years, he was right in there with Walter Clark, pitching their racist agenda to keep the Blacks in line. Now, the gentleman in the middle, that's Walter Doc Williams. He was executed within 20 days of being convicted of the rape of a white woman. And if you read the trial, which I have, in fact, I've written a play about it called Three Acts of Racial Terrorism, Walter uh, was not guilty. They just railroaded him. And the four guys on the right, those are the little Scottsboro boys. Uh, you may remember the case in Alabama, which was known as the Scottsboro boys. They even did a play about it on uh, Broadway. Very famous case that galvanized the black civil rights movement. Those were nine uh, black guys, black gentlemen that were arrested and convicted, and they tried to put them to death repeatedly. And in Alabama, um, the white women that claimed that they were raped later recanted, which was a very common thing back in the day. Uh, there was a lot of that going on where um, in order to protect the power of the white supremacist structure, one of the things that the South uh, was always uh, putting at the forefront was the fact that they needed to protect the white women from black men. Uh, so these four guys that you see on the right, those gentlemen are called the Little Scottsboro Boys because their case mirrored the big Scottsboro case out of Alabama. And where did this, the Little Scottsboro Boys came, uh, case come from? Fort Lauderdale. And who was the sheriff? Walter C. Clark. And it's a great historical interest for one reason. Um, in Chambers versus um, United States, it was the first time that the Supreme Court ruled, the US Supreme Court, that blacks had to be allowed to sit on petty juries. Those are the juries that determine guilt or innocence and grand juries, the ones that indict people. And they also ruled that torture could not be a form of acceptable police practice to extract confessions. Now you may find it hard to believe that it took until the 1930s, okay? And in order for that to be uh, become the ruling of the United States Supreme Court. But you, if you remember, our Supreme Court has always had a racist past. I'm sure you remember the Dred Scott decision that ruled that blacks were property. So I can rattle on all day, but uh, I'll stop and ask if there's any questions. 
so far? Is everybody awake? There was one question. How many years Clark reigned? 17 years. Clark was the sheriff of, of Bar County. And that was 17 extremely powerful years because um, I got to tell you, when the sheriff wanted something, he got it in those days. It's just what you've always heard about small town sheriffs. They basically ran the county. Um, they had the dirt on everybody. And uh, a lot of people belonged in those days to organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, the sheriffs, one of the major problems that the sheriff of our county always had was, and Dade County was trying to maintain his power against the encroachment of the Ku Klux Klan and other civic organizations. They were always trying to take over uh, his function. In Miami, the Klan used to ride around in open cars and open police cars wearing their hoods and robes through the neighborhood. I don't have any photos of that from Broward, but it was the same thing basically that was going on. 17 years, okay. Um, oh, it was the 30s that Clark was, um, I, you know, for a long time, even during the war years, during World War II, Clark was still a sheriff. So I, as I told you, 17 years, he spent a long period of time. These three cases that are on the screen, 1933 is the Reuben Stacy lynching, 1934 is the Walter Doc Williams, and uh, 1935, I'm sorry, I just screwed that up. 1935 was Reuben Stacy. Uh, 1933 was the Little Scottsboro Boys, and 1934 was Walter Doc Williams. Okay, so again, let me pause for a second, take a quick drink, and see if we have any questions. No, I don't hear I, this. The I have, yeah, nice go ahead. I have one. Thank Shoot. you. We really appreciate it. Um, do you remember Sheriff Ed Stack? Yes, Stack is well, I'm gonna show you his picture in a few minutes along with the photo of another, of a bunch of the sheriffs. It's a mixed bag, um, but in Stack's case, Stack is renowned for being the first sheriff to really modernize the Broward County Sheriff's Office. So he's been given kudos and then for a number of years because of the politicization of the office, not much was done until Bob Butterworth came in, uh, again, to improve the efficiency and modernize the department. So those two individuals, uh, Stack and Butterworth, are celebrated for the fact that they were really progressive and undertook um, a lot of reforms that were long needed but that other sheriffs before them, like Michelle, Alan Michelle and a bunch of the others, they weren't interested in doing. They were mainly interested in uh, maintaining the status quo and getting reelected and uh, using the sheriff's office to, uh, as I love to call it, the sheriff's horse fund. That's what it's known as, to line their pockets with as much money as they could from the operation of the jail and from the operation of the road patrols. But that's the... Uh, that's what it's called in historical terms, the sheriff's horse fund. So um, it's just a place where they steal money. So did I answer your question about Ed Stack? No, I, I was gonna ask you, yes, you did. But, but let me tell oh. you, do you know the story when um, United States Congressman J. Herbert Burke was at the strip club that used to be by the airport, all those strip clubs and Ed Stack set him up that he would be arrested in that in that strip club. And then Stack ran for Congress and beat Burke the next year. That's so a true story. You're right. You're right when they when you say the sheriffs, they had power. Yeah, they've always had phenomenal power. And again, one of my favorite subjects is Tony, but we'll get to that at the end to see what he has and has not been doing with the power. Uh, that Israel, Israel was excellent at spreading money around. Uh, we'll talk about that to maintain a base. Israel reminds me of Trump in some ways, uh, but again, I digress. So uh, you're right about that story about Ed Stack, but you got to remember there were very few rules back in those days, you know, uh, and the media didn't play the role that it plays today. In fact, the media in South Florida uh, and again, this is my opinion, but I've been watching this stuff since I arrived with the mayor of Boatlift as a United States attorney. And I was involved in a lot of the prosecutions of public officials, along with many other things that I've, I've done uh, as an assistant United States attorney for the Justice Department. And my experience has uniformly been 
that the media in South Florida has failed the public to bring to its attention. I mean, I talk to people all the time. They tell me they hate the Sun Sentinel. They wouldn't line the bottom of their birdcage with it, blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. But I'm not espousing whether or not you like the way the Sun Sentinel does its business. But you've got to remember that these um, newspapers are also political organizations. Their publishers go to parties and uh, are frequently approached by the various factions in South Florida to either publish or not publish things. And they have been extremely kind, I would say, over the years to law enforcement in South Florida. Much, much, um, because, you know, it's kind of a closed market, just like we only have one party in Broward County, which causes problems when you should have more competition between political parties. You don't have the competition between the media outlets down here. They basically back each other up and they don't do the expose type of uh, yellow journalism that you would hope they would do. And that's been one of the problems with the sheriff's office. It's allowed problems to go from day to day until they've become chronic and they have not been addressed. And then because they've not been addressed, they just carry on from sheriff to sheriff. Um, so I, I largely lay that at the feet of our media in South Florida. They should be doing the job of what we call the fourth estate, watching the sheriff's office much closer than they have been historically. What's gonna happen now with DeSantis and, and Tony? We'll talk about that. So did I respond to your question? Hello, I lost him. Yeah, still there? Okay, moving on, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> okay, go to the next slide, unless you have something else. Okay, so I mentioned Chambers versus Florida. And I told you that that came out of the little Scottsboro. Um, Linda Hawk keeps saying background noise is bad. We don't have any background noise here. So I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, next. Next, Hannah. Okay, we saw that picture. That's Walter C. Clark on the left, the sheriff of Broward County. Those are the little Scottsboro boys. We talked about Doc Williams. Next, there's Doc's mugshot. By the way, in case you're ever interested and you have an afternoon that you wanna blow, you should go down to the main public library, go up to the sixth floor, and every single arrest from the 1920s throughout the 50s is documented in these giant volumes, handbooks of, um, of jail arrests the names of the people that were arrested, the charges, and in most cases, the disposition. It's a real trip to grow, go through history like that. One thing I discovered when I took my crew down there, we were going through them. When Walter Clark eventually got arrested, it was at the behest of uh, a U.S. Senator named Estes Kefauver, who came down to conduct hearings into corruption in South Florida. And Walter was arrested along with Jimmy Blue Eyes. Allo, you remember the whole crew of uh, mafia characters that ran Hollywood and they ran the SNS syndicate and all these other gambling syndicates? Well, when you go down to the Broward County Historical Society archives on the sixth floor of the main library and you look at those arrest records, Walter was arrested, his brother Bob, the chief bed deputy, was arrested, and yet they, there's no mention of that in the jail's official records. They whitewashed Walter and his brother's arrest, the, the other sheriff employees. Uh, but everybody else is in there. Um, you remember, of course, uh, one of my favorite characters from history. He was a big figure in the Godfather movie. Uh, he played the part of the, the little Jewish guy. Um, that was um, uh, Meyer Lansky. And uh, Lansky's arrest is in those books and a bunch of other things. Just a lot of interesting history of important national historical figures uh, show up in Fort Lauderdale and uh, Broward's because of course uh, Walter Clark operated all the gambling um, facilities in Broward along with Meyer Lansky, the Colonial Inn, um, all those places what they called carpet joints. They were all owned and operated by the sheriff. So moving on Hannah, we still got you guys. Are we all right? No questions? No? Nobody's bored to death. 
That's a good shot of old Sparky where Walter uh, Clark pulled the switch on a number of people, uh, three black men in one year, uh, Walter executed all for raping a white woman. And the county wanted to go for a new record. To them, three wasn't enough. They wanted to have four in one day. That was a big subject of discussion back in the day. When were we gonna get, when were we gonna set the new record in Broward County for the entire state of Florida for executions in one day? And that was Walter, that was during Walter's period also. Next, you guys jump in whenever you have questions. All right, so we talked about the 1935 lynching of Reuben Stacy. That was in July, July 13th, 1935. Moving on. So that's a very good shot of uh, Reuben. Now, Reuben is actually hanging from that tree from a clothesline that was taken from the house of the woman who supposedly he was determined to rape. Of course, he never raped her. There was never any actual contact between them. Um, she was just scared. And uh, Marion Jones was her name. And so they took the clothesline from her house as a symbol. They, they then claimed that a hundred people showed up for Reuben's lynching and all of them were wearing masks. Well, you can see from this photo, that's a lie. And the Broward County state attorney, by, a guy by the name of Lewis Mayer, participated in the cover-up of the sheriff's lynching of Reuben Stacy. So it was a unified effort on the part of Broward County government to lynch this man and the, then to make sure that no one paid the price or was arrested for it. It went all the way to the state attorney. To what degree the judges participated in those days, you never know, they just sit on the bench. And because the inquests and the grand jury work is all done in secret um, as it is today. But uh, that's a clear picture that puts the lie to Lewis Mayer's report. He was the state attorney saying that they could not identify anybody that attended the lynching. Next, jump in if you have questions. Okay, so we've been seeing um, a lot of interest in the last few years because there is a lynching museum now in Mobile, uh, Mobile Alabama, which actually has a one of those stone monuments or metal monuments with the name of Reuben Stacy on it. Um, it's got 4,000 names and I've spoken to them and asked their support. One project that's on the burner somewhere for the crime museum is to get a monument erected to Reuben Stacy and to get a formal apology from the sheriff's office, which has never been done all these years. Many other towns have done this. Uh, and where would that monument go? Well, Reuben was lynched at the old Davy water plant, and it's still there. Uh, most of that pine forest that you see, Reuben, uh, where Reuben's lynching occurred, most of that pine forest is gone, but it would be easy to find a place to set aside some land and uh, set up a monument for Reuben. Next. So here's the first sheriff who found himself in hot water, A.W. Turner. So Turner's an interesting character because he rose from the ashes after he had been charged and acquitted and then removed by the governor from office for malfeasance, misfeasance. Uh, in Turner's case, Turner was operating during the period of what they called the wiretappers. And the wiretappers were interesting characters. There was a great movie called The Sting. Remember it starred, um, uh, Woody, who was that great actor from um, Jaws? He, he was um, he was he played the victim in that. In that, but it also starred Paul, Paul Newman, and it starred um, Robert Redford. And I can't remember Robert Robert somebody was the uh, was the gangster in that movie, and he played the, uh, the shark hunter captain in Jaws. So, anyways, long story short, uh, Turner was alleged to be taking bribes from the wiretappers to operate. And the wiretappers operated just like you saw in the movie, where they would convince their victims that they had advanced knowledge just before a race was run. And so you could still place a bet and win that bet. 
and they had these wires that ran, they were dedicated for that purpose to the different uh, um, horse races uh, venues around the country. So anyways, when Turner failed to put anybody in jail for wiretapping, the governor sent down a private investigator of his own, of his choosing. They put a case against a lot of the wiretappers together. And the outcome of that was the first hospital in Broward County was paid for in the amount of $20,000. And that was exactly the amount that the judge levied against the first set of wiretappers. So basically the judge was collecting the money so that they could put the, put the hospital together. But when Turner failed to, they said, exercise his duty, he was removed. Well, guess what? Turner felt that wasn't fair. So the next election cycle that came up, he ran and he got his job back. Now, who do we know just tried to do that? Huh? Scott Israel, right? But Israel couldn't pull it off because Turner had significant grievances against the way he had, his case was handled. And the city at that time in the county, to the degree it was populated, felt bad for Turner and thought he had been railroaded. Israel tried to do the same thing. He tried to create sympathy for himself among the, the population claiming he had been railroaded. If you remember Israel's advertising, they kept saying, let's not let Tallahassee decide who our sheriff is going to be. And this was his attempt to basically duplicate what Turner had done back in the early 1900s, unsuccessful, as we know, because Scott beat him. So that's where Turner's main claim to fame comes in. He rose from the ashes and was twice the sheriff once after being removed from office. Just an interesting story. Next. Again, jump in if you have any questions. I love this photo because everybody in it is a deputy sheriff, except for the guy on the right who's wearing the straw boater. That's uh, Paul Bryan. And this was the Paul Bryan administration. And what I love about it is they could have just cut the bodies off and used the headshots for mugshots because every one of these guys went to jail for uh, prohibition era corruption. They were all up to their eyeballs in protecting the local smugglers. And if you know anything about South Florida history, you know there's a reason why we've had corruption in the sheriff's office during these periods of times. Now, of course, this was during prohibition, during the 1930s. The guy on the left, Big Bill Hicks, the big heavy guy, he was the chief deputy. He went to trial three times for murdering a guy, uh, emasculating him, and throwing him in a canal after he cut him open for the alligators. And in those three trials, he was found three hung juries or he was convicted and the Court of Appeals overturned his case. So you got really a, a nice uh, set of mugshots here if you need them. What's interesting about Brian was of course, <laughs> Brian like every sheriff who's gotten himself in trouble, aligned himself with the economic needs of the county. And when the economy wasn't doing well during the depression, during prohibition, Brian took it upon himself to allow the liquor to flow freely. This whole thing has been called the liberal policy. And it's been discussed in those terms over the years again and again, as to why sheriffs and why in particular sheriffs uh, end up having problems of corruption in Broward County. And a good argument has been put forward. And I think it's a sound argument that the sheriff represents the people and reflects their values of the county. And people wanted liquor. And Paul Bryant wasn't going to stand in, his, in their way. And uh, we have other instances of that type of activity coming up in some of the other slides. Again, questions, fire away. Next. There's Walter. Man, he looks good, doesn't he? You never know. He was lynching and murdering black men left and right. Walter was famous for dumping the bodies of black men at the George, uh, George Benton funeral home. And he and um, Bob would tie men that they had murdered to the uh, hood of their car and parade through the black community with these guys on display. And then they'd end up at the Benton funeral home, cut the body loose, dump it on the ground and say, here's another one for you, George. And uh, it was almost a, a ritual with these guys. It's incredible how much uh, these two would have had to answer for 
if the system had any interest in pursuing them. Of course, back in those days, uh, the FBI was just starting and um, J. Edgar Hoover made pronouncements that the FBI was not interested in going after abuse of power by county sheriffs in the South. So he gave them free reign, sent them a message, do your worst. That changed later, but not during Walter's reign until that Senator I mentioned earlier, Kafaver came down and started those corruption hearings. Next. There's Eddie Lee. Anybody remember Eddie Lee, baseball player? He was a very popular person because he was a well-known sports figure. And when um, one of our sheriffs had to be replaced for corruption, the governor went to Eddie Lee and asked Eddie Lee to take over. And Eddie had a short reign, uh, and, but Eddie was known for being one of the first sheriffs to really genuinely crack down on uh, gambling in Broward County. Not on everybody, some people got a pass, but at least he, he made an effort to go after certain operators and, and made a big show of it, put it in the newspapers. So I would say more than anything else, that was Eddie Lee's most famous, uh, that plus being a great baseball player, his most famous claim to fame during the time he was a Broward County Sheriff, the, the Sheriff of Broward County, sorry. Uh, here's a question. Is there can, any connection between the sheriffs? I can't see the rest of the question. Well, go to the next slide then, Hannah, while we try and bring that up. Well, Whiskey Creek, as you know, was the site of the Whiskey, Whiskey Creek murders. And Whiskey Creek has always been a famous smuggling location in and out of Broward County. You remember the Whiskey Creek murders? That was uh, Jake, Jake the Snake and um, uh, Murph the Surf and all those guys, they dumped the bodies of those two secretaries, quote unquote, into the Whiskey Creek. Um, this was in the 1960s. You remember uh, Alan Murphy, also known as Murph the Surf? He, his great uh, claim to fame was that he threw the quarterback, Paul Hornig, down a set of stairs that he had the keys to all of the Miami Beach hotels that he bought from uh, their employees. So he would go in and, and rob the wealthy, uh, especially jewels from the, the wealthy women that were visiting in the beach. Uh, and then he went to New York and he, uh, he and his two buddies, uh, I can't remember, it was Albert somebody. Anyways, he and his two buddies robbed the Natural History Museum of the DeLong Ruby and the Star of India Sapphire. And then, uh, John D. McDonald, the guy that runs that foundation, the famous John D. McDonald, was tapped to recover those jewels from a phone booth in Palm Beach. So that's another great story for another day, but not so much about the sheriffs. Here's your, here's your friend, uh, Mr. Stack, that you were asking me about. And as I, I told you before, Ed Stack was most known for, for example, he was really spearheaded the bringing of communications, radio communications that worked throughout the county, um, modernizing the fleet of vehicles, uh, bringing in a bomb squad. Uh, even though in those days, the bomb squad consisted of a guy with a long stick, you know, that he would poke whatever it was with and hope it didn't blow up in his face. It was, at least they tried, you know? So uh, if no questions, next. We're moving along here, guys. How are we doing time-wise, Hannah? It's 132. Okay, I got it. We got about 20 minutes. Next, there we go. Really one of my favorite people in the whole world, Bob Butterworth, good guy. We went too far, too fast. You know, a good guy, renowned by everybody. Um, just the kind of guy that you really, with a temperament that you really want to see in the sheriff's office with the intellect. A lot of the sheriffs that we've had uh, have aspects of that in their character. Ken Jen, who I consider to be, or Jenny, depending on how you like to pronounce his name, uh, who I consider to be a friend, is one of the smartest people I've ever known, without a doubt. Um, what a great organizer. He's got skills. Uh, and look at the positions that he held before he became sheriff that led to his downfall. But like so many of the other sheriffs, they're not completely well-rounded people and their weaknesses end up bringing about their downfalls. So Butterworth, in my opinion, was one of those rare individuals who had it all and could bring 
to bear on the problems of the sheriff's department, the chronic problems of the sheriff's department, not only those skills, but also the personality so that people respected him and listened and, and followed his commands. So he's just, I just think, if anything, he's been our greatest sheriff in the history of Broward County. Who's next? Well, oh, now if you ask him, he was the greatest sheriff in the history of Broward County, Nick Navarro. Nick will be the first person to tell you that Nick was a gift. Uh, you should really pick up a, a gift to the people of Broward County. You should really pick up a copy of his book, Cuban Cop. Uh, that's, you know, it, 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 the title says a great deal, but it also uh, tells you a lot of uh, the Nick Navarro anecdotes the, from the times that Nick was just running amok in Broward County. Anybody have any great stories about Nick they want to share? Most people do. No? Okay. Again, we're, the clock is ticking down here, so I got to keep moving. Um, you remember the Cops show? Remember Cops, the show? That was one of Nick's uh, great innovations and great fiascos, as it turned out. Now, the Cochrane uh, Public Safety Building sits on 27th and Broward Boulevard. And Ron Cochran, as you probably know, died of cancer. Um, so that cut his term uh, short. But um, Ron was, I don't think, really ever had enough time to really pursue the different things that he wanted to do. Um, he was one of those placeholder sheriffs, and we've had two or three of them. Um, he did some things. He promoted women, which had not been done much in the Broward County Sheriff's Office prior to his um, acceptance of the position. And, you know, he was well liked. Everybody liked Ron. But unfortunately, he just didn't have the time to do the job the way he wanted to do it. Um, that's about all I've got to say about Ron, given the time I've got. What, what do we got next? And of course, Ken Jen. How, how do you reconcile the fall from grace of a guy so brilliant and, and so talented? I don't know, you know, people, he ended up serving, I think a year, maybe a year and a half at a farm uh, in, the, in the federal prison system where basically he told me he planted carrots for a year. What a waste of this man's immense skills and intellect. Um, he, as you probably remember, he got into trouble for these um, private schemes that he was engaged in with a couple of his uh, higher up uh, uh, underlings. And he also got um, accused of um, not properly reporting uh, his income and of course his participation in these security firms that he was working with. So obviously money was a, was a factor in what happened to Ken, but money is never the only factor unless you're starving, not for public officials like this. There's also an issue of power. There's also an issue of being able to wield the money that you earn in ways which allow you to gain more power and more influence. And there's also an issue of you know, supervision, whether or not you're the type of person that can really crack down on the people that don't do the job the way they should in your own department. One of the chronic problems, um, hold on one second. Could you tell about what time these people were in office for those who are not from the area? Well, yeah. Um, Ed Stack was in the 50s. Uh, you know, we've jumped over a bunch of other sheriffs. Uh, Alan Michelle's not here. Um, Ken Jen was in the uh, 1990s. Um, what was I going to say about Jen? I was, I was saying that Ken had a, uh, ref, had a, pro, a program that he put together called Power Track. And the idea was that he was going to improve the efficiency of the Broward Sheriff's Office by making the sheriffs respond to certain deadlines, the deputies, the investigatory de de deadlines. Uh, if you guys read the paper today, there's an expose about the Florida Highway Patrol in the Sun Sentinel not caring enough, closing files out, dropping things like DNA testing and stuff that would lead to the identity of people that had not been identified. So this was a lot of the stuff that goes on 
a lot of this stuff goes on today in different departments, but it also was going on at the Broward Sheriff's Office. So Ken came up with the idea of power track. The problem with power track was that it was abused by the underlings to accuse people of crimes they had not committed so that they could close those files out and have a high success ratio, which there was a great deal of pressure that was being put on them by, by Ken. So again, you know, good ideas in reforming the sheriff's department still have to be implemented by guys like Bob Butterworth. It's one thing to have an idea that the problem, that the department has a problem. It's another thing to have the personality and the skills to see that through to some type of reform. The sheriff's office will eat your lunch if it can. By that I mean eat the sheriff's lunch if it can. It's a difficult organization, it's huge. It's got one of the largest budgets, if not the largest budget in the country for um, its various functions because one, another thing that Ken Jen did was expand the department into um, emergency services like paramedics and, and what used to be called ambulance services. So he aggrandized all this power in his hands, but he didn't have the ability to control his minions. And like I said, those minions will eat your lunch if, if you aren't about Butterworth. Moving on. You know, the, the great thing about Lamberti, when um, Lamberti ran against Israel and lost, was his hard drives from his office were all taken out and destroyed. Now, this is one of those stories, what if, you know? What happens if Israel had gotten into office and he got his hands on those hard drives? Why did Lamberti feel it necessary to give his underlings the job to destroy that, that evidence about how his op office operated? I don't know. Nobody knows because the hard drives got destroyed. We only know that that's a very interesting thing that went on. Uh, as we also know, um, there's about to be a change in power next month. We've had a state attorney in Broward County, uh, Mike Satz, who's been in office for over 40 years since Nixon was the president. And uh, he instituted a program in the last year to try and set aside convictions that had been improperly obtained by his own office under his own command. So when we talk about Briar County, you wanna take a step back and take a look at the big picture. You have to take a look at the way the, Democrat, the Democratic Party, for good or for bad, has always dominated the county. And as a result, we haven't had the type of competition between politicians who are constitutionally elected officers like Lamberti and Satz and um, Foreman, who used to be um, uh, the, the county clerk. And now of course his ex-wife, Brenda is the county clerk. And you ask yourself, why do we have all this inbreeding in Broward County? Why does this go on? Well, it goes on because of the way our, pol our political system uh, handles these things and the failure of what, what we call the fourth estate, the newspapers to really expose these types of problems. Anyways, what else can you say about Al Lamberti? He was a Republican in a Democratic county and he was appointed to that office uh, because the hope has always been, no matter what you read about how excellent uh, these nominees to this office is, the hope out of Tallahassee has always been that they could change Broward from being Democratic to Republican, and that they could appoint Republican officials in Broward County so that um, the, the, the power would shift from the hands of the traditional one, one party county system that we have had for many, 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 many years. And that's how Lamberti got into office. What's next? We're running out of time here. We only got 15 minutes or less. There we go. Do you guys remember this? When um, Scott Israel was up uh, at the, um, what do they call it now? The B&B &B Center? What's it called now? The, where the Panthers play, you know, whatever the name of it is. Um, and he was up there arguing with that uh, uh, lady, Dana, I can't remember her name, uh, from the NRA. And he, he took her on and said, we've got to do something about this. So what's happened with Parkland, guys? Huh? Do we ever hear much about Parkland anymore? 17 people dead? you know, a failure of the sheriff's office. That's not just me saying it, it's the voters who said it.
I mean, and of course was not the only time, whether you were a Scott Israel supporter, because you thought his uh, uh, term was being undermined by forces that were against him or not, it's the job of the sheriff to overcome those types of forces. And Scott Israel did not succeed at that. He also had a major problem the day that uh, that uh, kid got off the plane, picked up his bag, got his gun, and then killed those people. Remember what a nightmare that was at the at the at the uh, uh, at the airport. Fifteen, sixteen jurisdictions all running around. By jurisdiction, I mean police departments. Nobody coordinating anything. People being marched on and off the tarmacs. No radio communications. You have to understand one of the big complaints about Scott Israel, which is a valid complaint, which was never addressed, was the fact he failed to get the bus drivers and the county bus system off the same radio network that the sheriffs operated. That, that just was a basic function of the sheriff. If you want to have dedicated service, you want your radio calls, calls to go out, you want your radio calls to come in, then you have to have your own radio net. Instead, he operated with the rest of the county. And that went on for years and years. Remember, they were fighting over Hollywood. Are they going to put that tower on top of the... You remember all that? That's all part and parcel of all of that. Well, a sheriff like Butterworth would have gotten that done. Somebody who understood the politics of the job, knew how to do the job, dedicated himself to things that were of ultimate priority and let other things go by the wayside. But what... Israel spent a lot of time doing was spreading around the money, you know, making sure that the community organizations that came to him for money, they got their money, that they saw the sheriff as being a person that was supportive, using his budget for their particular area of interest. And other things like the radio net went begging. And so this all came up during the competition uh, and it may come up again um, because, as you know, there's a number of people, including Israel, that are suing the governor now over Scott's appointment because of Scott's failure to disclose that shooting, which he killed a man back in Pennsylvania, and the other things that we haven't really talked about yet. Uh, so there's a lawsuit pending now over that. There may be another election for the sheriff's office. When does this ever end? Well, it ends when we take this position as a serious, I'm sorry, it is serious law enforcement, I don't mean to say that, as more serious in terms of its law enforcement functions than its political functions. And that's been the problem with the Broward County Sheriff's Office over and over and over again. Nick Navarro uh, was a master at that, you know, so, um, and I can go on and on. But that would require the county commission and don't forget, the sheriff's a constitutionally elected officer. So it would require uh, a gentleman who gets elected to office that really has the strength of character to take on these issues and wants to take them on and wants to reform the department. We have not seen that, not till now. Next. There is our friend, Mr. Tony. What can we say about Mr. Tony? Well, I'm not so sure what we can say about him, but it's going to be interesting what they say about him in the near future. According to the Sun Sentinel, he's under investigation again for undisclosed other, um, could they be more failure to accurately portray his history when he applied for the job? Could we be seeing more of those types of things? I don't know. I've asked around the department, various people that I know, and it's a big mystery. The betting is that on his application, when he got the job, he failed to disclose other things or he distorted other things. And those, um, besides the fact that he had been involved in this um, death of this guy that he shot in self-defense, and those applications are all made under penalties of perjury. So ask yourself this question, can we have a sheriff who's committed perjury? I mean, can we tolerate that? And what's going to happen if uh, the FDLE now he's under investigation, not by the Broward County Sheriff's Office, although I'm sure they have a ghost file, but he's under investigation by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And FDLE is under a lot of pressure from the governor's office to get rid of him. 
you may remember DeSantis famously went into the newspapers and said, Tony's not my sheriff. <laughs> remember that? That's a quote. And this was after he appointed him and reached out and asked him for the job. And now, you know, you can call it the rats are running from the, the sinking ship or you can call it whatever you want. But Tony is now as much a potential political liability as he was a forward progressive appointment being the black, first black or African-American to hold the position in a county with a horrific uh, history of racial violence, which I haven't even touched on here today. It's not my job, so I'm not gonna get into it But today. But Broward County has a lot to answer for in its history. It really does in terms of how it's treated its minorities and still does. I mean, you may have seen the other day, the McBean case, uh, the judge threw out the case against the county, the sheriff's office. McBean was the gentleman that was walking with an air rifle held across his shoulders on his back. And he was shot by a, a uh, Broward County Sheriff's officer named Paul Peraza. And uh, Peraza got his case, the criminal case against him tossed out. What was interesting was that was the first prosecution against the cop basically for a line of duty shooting in over 250 investigations that the sheriff, that the state attorney had opened. And then the judge, judge by the name of Michael Yusan, tossed the case out on stand your ground. That hope, that went up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upheld it. So now um, the question is gonna become, what's gonna happen in the civil case? Because the civil case against the officer is still going on. And the allegation has been made that McBean had earbuds in his ears couldn't hear the commands of the officers, and then they tampered with that evidence after the shooting. A bunch of other claims that have been made that a bunch of perjury was engaged in a cover-up by the sheriff's office, which was originally tasked to investigate the case and never should have been. It should have been given strictly to the FDLE to look into and the statements and other evidence right. gathered by them. Anyways, what else can we say about Sheriff Tony? You have any questions about Tony? Nobody cares? Nobody cares who our sheriff is. Well, the other scuttlebutt around the sheriff's office about the sheriff is that he's made the department extremely top heavy with, um, what would you call it, uh, command staff, rather than dealing with some of the allocation of resources that he should have been doing. He's been putting money and um, power into the hands of this inner circle. And uh, it's showing up in various problems, various ways. And um, whether that's a function of Tony's lack of administrative experience, you may remember he was a sergeant at the Coral Springs Police Department. He really had no high level experience to run a multi-billion dollar enterprise like the Broward County Sheriff's Office. I'm not faulting him. Anybody can take a job and learn on the job and go out and take on the necessary educational uh, courses, whatever, whatever the job needs, the job can require. But the, the complaint you keep hearing about the sheriff's office is that it's too top heavy now. We're gonna have to see if uh, Tony runs into a problem like the airport shooting or Parkland. Uh, that will be a true test of his mettle. And if it's gonna happen anywhere, history teaches us it's happening here. It always happens to us, which goes back to why does that happen? And it goes back to the question of why do our sheriffs pander to our communities in such political ways? And why does South Florida always put the buck, the buck ahead of good government, making a buck ahead of good government? And that traces back to the 1920s, 1930s. I mean, Florida doesn't even have a commercial corruption statute commercial bribery statute. It's one of the few, maybe two or three states in the entire country that don't have a commercial bribery statute. And that's because the legislature doesn't want one <laughs> because they're the people that are gonna get arrested most frequently under that statute. So um, I can go on all day about the liberal policy and the tendency of Broward. As Faulkner said, the past is not dead. The past is not even past. Uh, because we still suffer and have suffered from a lot of the lack of good government 
that uh, began in the 20s when Al Capone arrived and corrupted the entire uh, governance of Miami-Dade and Broward County, which of course in those days was only known as Dade, um, and has carried on through our, uh, we have stricter requirements of proof when it comes to these public corruption cases than other states do. Um, the discussion over the quid pro quo, you know, you gotta give me something to get something out of me. And anyways, I digress. The point is we've been too, too lenient and the press has not been strong enough. And that's why you see over and over again, sheriff after sheriff in the Broward County history, falling, being removed from office, being indicted, going to trial for corruption, taking money. It's a chronic condition. You go around the country, you're not gonna find another sheriff's office like it. That's what I gotta say. Anybody disagree with me, here's your chance. Everybody's still awake, here's your chance. Have I disappointed anybody? No? Okay. No feedback. Um, I have some feedback. Chris, thank you for the most, that was so enlightening and yet so incredibly depressing. Huh. Um, I don't think. There's like no hope here, as far as I can tell. It doesn't sound like rocket science for someone to come in. I mean, would it take someone from the outside to come in and clean it up? And that's when is that going to happen? Well, okay. So you have a, a vice president in the form of Kamala Harris coming into office. There's a lot of talk about reinstating the consent decrees that the Justice Department abolished under Jeff Sessions. A lot of things that, the, you know, I was a Fed for 10 years. I was chief of the United States Attorney's Office here. I understand the role of federalism in government in the United States. We have a state system, a county system, and a federal system. And the role of the Fed, the FBI, the Justice Department, the, the alphabet soup of federal law enforcement agencies, ATF, CIA, whatever, the role of those agencies has always been as a backstop, as a menace to, to, because the federal agencies have much, much less corruption. They have more money, they're better managed. You know, they're, they have the access to the US treasury that the local and state organizations don't have. So before Sessions abolished the consent decrees, we, Broward Sheriff may have well, I think it should have under Israel, been the subject of a Justice Department effort to get a consent decree shoved down the sheriff's office throat as to how they do business, their day-to-day -day operations, you know, the stuff that affects the basic function of providing protection to the public, but also affects the implementation of things like civil rights. Well, when Donald Trump came into office, you know, he really had had no sense of history, no sense of what he was doing. He didn't understand that if you remove something like consent decrees from the power of the Justice Department and cut local sheriff's offices and county sheriff's offices and other places loose from, from federal supervision, that the worst of the worst is gonna happen. It's just a question of where the seeds for the worst of the worst to happen have already been planted and then they will bloom. So when Sessions announced that, every crook, every rotten manager, every bum that ever had authority in every county and every state of the union wiped their brow and said, I don't have to worry about the feds coming after me. I can do what I want. And so we really got to return to an era. I don't care about a lot of the politics, but I care deeply about this. We have to return to an era where the Justice Department is given the authority to do its job. And if they, if they come back in, one of these days I'm gonna write Kamala Harris a letter and say, you better take a look at what's been going on in Broward all these years. And why do these chronic conditions continue? They don't get better, they just get worse. You know, or one gets worse, the other one gets addressed, but nobody takes an overall view to the problem. And it could, and the feds could do something about this. They really could. 
And if they did, great. I'd like you to write that letter sooner rather than later, but um, we, do have we, we do have a question um, from Lane Berman who said, uh, is the crime museum open during COVID? And there's, she thanks you for your talk. Oh, you're really welcome. Awesome. Um, no, we have not been open because the crime museum isn't really huge. It's, it's okay, but it's not huge. And so the six foot separation, okay, but it doesn't really feel like it. You know what I'm saying? And we've been very concerned about uh, people coming to the museum and then suing us because, you know, they were exposed to uh, COVID or something else at the museum. I, we just, like everybody else, we're just hanging out by our fingernails. We're a nonprofit. We've had no income since February. So basically we're just, you know, struggling. But I'm committed to keeping it open because I've always said, if you want to have this dialogue, if you want to have this discussion, you have to have an entity that is not the newspapers, that is not the local government, and is not the political parties in Broward County. You have to have an independent entity that brings these issues to the forefront, a gadfly that runs around and says, no, 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 no. The voters need to take a look at this. And that's, I, I've always dreamed that would be the role of the crime museum among all the other stuff that we do, but COVID just kicked us in the butt like so many other people. But we'll be back. Chris, we look forward to that day. Um, I, I want to just follow up quickly. I know it's time to end, but and um, Karen's going to have some closing remarks. But what can we do about Ruben Stacy about that? You know, memorial. What can we do about? It? Well, okay. You got to remember Hollywood. Remember when they tried to change the street names? Mm -hmm. Jeez, Louise. You know, we were right at the center of that whole debate about um, whether or not this is destroying our history. Of course, people that say that don't realize that all these monuments and these streets names weren't named until years after the Civil War. And they were all put up by the daughters of the, of, uh, the Confederacy and the, the organizations that had uh, an interest in rewriting history. The ones that claim that the war was not about slavery. It was about states' rights and crap like that. So there's gonna be a fight over this. There's gonna be a fight over this. So again, I've always said, uh, we've got those people in Mobile, Alabama that are backing us and at the lynching museum. Um, Reuben was a victim. I mean, just an out and out victim. There should be a point where school kids go by the monument of Reuben Stacy and they learn something, they see something, they see a movie, they see something about what life was like in Broward. And the other thing is while I'm talking, those three events, Walter, Doc Williams, the little Scottsboro boys and the lynching, they were all connected. Nothing happened back in those days, 33, 34 and 35, without a core of racist white supremacists operating in South Florida. And guess what guys, Florida still leads the nation in white supremacist organizations, leads the nation. So I'll stop because otherwise I'll go all day. Sorry. Karen, you have to unmute. Karen wanted to end a few, uh, to say a few words. Karen? Thank you, Hannah. Um, can you hear me? Okay, I just wanted to say thank you again, Chris. You do such a wonderful job. People are already asking for more. Um, our, if you're unfamiliar with us, the Historical Society Research Center is open now on certain dates by, um, you know, if you want to make a phone call and make an appointment, of course you have to mask up. We're only there Tuesdays and Fridays. So a phone call is important. Our membership is $25 a year for a single member. And uh, this is our last lecture for 2020. And we're going to go with a boom into 2021. Our next lecture is January 17th. And uh, again, it will be a, no a, a nostalgic musical event provided by Chai, the past president of the Hollywood Music Club. She will be playing and singing songs from the 1940s, uh, starting the new year on a happy, entertaining mode. 
and I hope everybody can enjoy it. We're on Facebook, Hollywood Historical Society, and we have our web page, Hollywood Historical Society, and we will announce the rest of the lectures. I have it scheduled for the whole year on Zoom, but if the library opens, we may talk about that. And I see a no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, I love these. I hope you enjoy these lectures. I didn't. I thought it was boring. <laughs> Chris, this was a classic, classic afternoon. Thank you so much. Really appreciate huh. it. Okay. Anytime. Okay. Somebody Happy asked. holidays, everybody. I'm going to end now. Happy holidays. Same to everyone.